start. Welcome to the uh, presentation. Um, my name is Bill Higginbotham. I'm with EA Technology in the United States, and I'm uh, responsible for North and South America. And I'll be uh, talking to you about uh, full-time partial discharge monitoring, which is a large part of what uh, my company does. Um, at the uh, end of the presentation, or so sometime shortly thereafter, the video will be available. We'll also put it on our YouTube site so that you can uh, watch it any time or pass it on to anyone you like. We'll also uh, provide a written set of question and answers, and we will provide a, a PDF of the presentation to all the attendees. So don't feel you need to take screenshots of that. You'll, you'll get all this. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the types of partial discharge. Not going to spend much time on that. I've done several other videos that are available on our YouTube site that cover PD in depth. If you have any more questions on PD, contact me afterwards. I just I can't spend a lot of time on that today. We won't get to what's new. I'll talk a little bit about online test methods and specifically non-invasive testing technology. And then we'll get into monitoring and what's what's good about it, what's bad about it. Uh, how you lay it out, how you install it. We'll talk a little bit about data analysis because that's something that people don't tend to catch a lot on. And during this whole presentation, I'm going to be referring to our power, our uh, monitoring system, and that because that's what I have the most experience on. Uh, there are other systems out there. I'm not saying ours is uh, the only one, but it's the only one I have pictures and screenshots of. So that's what I'll be using today. So. We at EA like to break down partial discharge into three main types of PD. Uh, one is the first one is internal discharges. Uh, this is where you have a void, an air bubble, defect, delamination, some sort of cavity inside the solid insulation. And that's unique in that it does not create much ultrasonic energy, does not create sound waves, but it does create a, a, something called TEV. And I'll talk more about that. It's transient earth voltage. And it creates UHF, radio waves. Uh, that can be detectable. Uh, surface discharge is by far the most common. My experience is it's 95% of the PD out there. Uh, it is uh, the fastest moving. It tracks across the surface of the insulation. It's affected by humidity, contamination, uh, air temperature, lots of different things, damage, uh, and it moves fastest, but it's also the easiest to detect. It creates radio waves as well in the UHF band. Uh, ultrasonic, it creates a lot of ultrasonic energy, and that's great. Uh, easy to find, easy to, to detect. Uh, it also creates UV light. So ultraviolet light, uh, it's a spark, and you can detect that spark. If you're looking at cables or metal clad switchgear or something like that, UV light isn't very good because you need a line of sight to get to it. Corona discharge is the one most people are common with. This is where you have discharge, but instead of traveling along the surface of the insulation, it travels through the air. And uh, this is very common in EHV substations. It's more due to construction and design, a bolt sticking out, a sharp edge on a, a bracket uh, where the air cannot withstand the field applied to it, and that creates a corona discharge. The nice thing about corona discharge is that the insulation that you're damaging, the insulation you're destroying is air molecules. So they are constantly replaced, and we want to uh, know about corona because it does have very similar characteristics to surface discharge, but we want to make sure that we don't confuse the two. So we don't want to go off and try and fix a corona problem when it's not going to lead to catastrophic failure anytime soon. And we don't want to miscategorize surface discharge as corona and not attack that. So we need to know the difference. So those are the three main types of PD. Uh, and there's a variety of different tests you can do for PD. It's been around, PD testing has been around 40 years at least. Um, the, uh, the classic method, the, uh, the method that is used by a lot of people is offline. And this is where you take the system out of service. You, if it's cable, you lift the ends, you disconnect it from the rest of the system, and then you apply a line voltage or higher than line voltage and measure for PD. And this is really good because you can have a perfectly clean, low noise power source. The downside is you need a power source at line voltage. So if you look at this lower picture, they were trying to get uh, over 300 kV on the line, on a cable, and they couldn't get there, even with three tractor trailers full of equipment. Medium voltage in that, the upper right-hand corner, you see some typical equipment that people use. It's a great test, 
but it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of equipment. It takes uh, an outage. You have to take everything out of service. Uh, you have to be able to generate line voltage so there's safety issues. Uh, you're generating this voltage with the, the doors open. So offline tests are good. They're probably the best test in terms of giving you results, but they're by far the hardest to do. So that way they're good, certainly better than doing nothing. Better are what we call online tests. So these are tests where you're using the power system as your, your voltage source. The system is in service. It's, it's real world conditions. You've got uh, your load, you've got your temperature, you've got your heat rise, you've got current flow, you've got all these things. You've got 60 hertz as opposed to the offline tests are very often done at 0.1 hertz or 0.01 hertz. So it's more real world. And the equipment pictured here is all for doing spot tests. So this is uh, for doing spot tests on switch gear or cable or overhead gear. And these are great tests and they don't require an outage. They don't take long to do. Uh, and they are better, therefore, than offline tests. However, they are a snapshot in time. And, and if system condition changes, then you, if you're not measuring it when the PD is present, then you're not seeing the PD. The best system uh, is, is kind of a, a, a hybrid where you're measuring continuously online. So we're, we're, we're not taking an outage, the system's up and running, we're monitoring all the various points all the time, we can compare them to load, we can compare them to humidity, we can compare measurements one versus another. You know, perhaps it's occurring in one cabinet but not another. Uh, so if you can take all these measurements 24 seven, you can watch them evolve over time, that's gonna be your best solution. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about today is 24 seven online monitoring. Now, if you're going to do online monitoring, you can take it two ways. You can connect with, with high voltage expensive components to every point you want to test. That would be a direct connected test and you would use coupling capacitors and, and things like that. Uh, that's very invasive to install. You need a long outage to put those all in. You need high, uh, high voltage components to decouple from the, the, the connections to the monitoring equipment. Uh, we're going to talk today about non-invasive online testing. So this is testing you can do without connecting to the high voltage, so it's safer. You can often do these tests without even uh, opening the equipment. The installation of the monitoring equipment can be done online, live, without affecting operations, whether you're a utility or a refinery or a paper mill. You can put this on and take it off without taking, out, taking the equipment out of service. And so the techniques that we use one is going to be ultrasonic or, or acoustic testing, sometimes it's called. We're going to look through from the outside. We're going to look through the louvers, through the vents. We're trying to get some air path from the source of PD to the sensor. Uh, if we don't have an air path, we can use a contact sensor. But basically, we're listening for any ultrasonic activity in a given compartment. And this, obviously, if we're outside the compartment looking in, is non-invasive. TEV makes use of the transient earth voltage phenomenon. So this is a phenomenon EA discovered back in the late 70s where an actual voltage appears on the outside of metal clad switchgear as a result of internal discharge inside the switchgear. Uh, I'll talk more about that, but that is, again, it's a, a voltage probe applied to the outside surface of the switchgear, and that's going to be inherently safe and doesn't need any kind of outage to attach. The next one is kind of a borderline. So this is an RFCT, a radio frequency current transformer. This is a radio frequency uh, device that is a split core transformer. It clamps around something. We uh, clamp around the ground strap, not around the conductor. So we're not as safety critical in that we're, we're right on the conductor, we're at the ground, we're, we're down by the ground bar of the equipment. Obviously you need an outage to attach these unless you have IEC type switch gear where the ground straps are outside the high voltage compartment. In North America and most of South America, you use ANSI type switch gear where the ground straps are inside the, uh, inside the high voltage compartment. For those, you will need to take an outage, but as long as you've got the RCTs installed, you can uh, pretty much do whatever you want because they're brought to the outside surface. Uh, UHF testing, so this is detecting radio waves. And this is really good because radio waves are emitted anytime you have discharge, you have a spark. Uh, you know, if you, if you drive by a, a substation with a lot of corona, you'll get radio interference. Um, so UHF is good inside cables or inside metal clad switch gear. It's not that good because you've got a Faraday cage around the source. So UHF testing is good unless you can, is, is not 
possible in metal side switch gear unless you get an antenna inside the switch gear. And that's not something we're doing right now. We're not going to talk about that today. Uh, so these are the four uh, methods we're going to use in our monitoring that allows us to apply a monitor or remove it without taking an outage. A little more detail on ultrasonic testing. So when you have service discharge, like this picture here, someone had a trifurcated cable and they cut the shields back way too uh, early and they're too close together and you've got that characteristic white powder, you've got the, the carbon tracking on the surface. Uh, anytime you've got that, it's gonna generate a lot of audio waves. So these, are, these are not radio waves, that they're, they're actual audio pressure waves, but they're in the range above the range of human hearing. 40 kilohertz is a, is a common center frequency. It's where a lot of people test. Uh, very sensitive equipment is used to detect this. Uh, you know, we have measured the, 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 the blink of a human eye to be about the level that the amount of ultrasonic energy given off by your eyes when you blink is where we consider there to be a problem. So we're talking some very sensitive test equipment. But the nice thing is in metal clad switch gear and in other areas, there isn't a lot of other ultrasonic energy. So you can pick this up. Um, when it's really bad, you can actually hear it with the naked ear. But as when you, by the time you can hear with the naked ear and it's in the audio band, then you kind of need to uh, need to get out of there. Uh, so uh, this is what we're doing for ultrasonic. We're going to measure in the 40 kilohertz range. We need some path from the source of the sensor. So if you look at this picture, this is inside metal clad switch gear. I either need to have a sensor inside that gear or outside that gear that can pick up sound waves. And so we can have a sensor that aims through a louver or a vent or some kind of opening. We could have a sensor inside there. We could have a sensor that's a contact sensor that mounts the door and then turns the entire door into a sensor. And that can actually sense what's going on inside the door. And that works really well for very tightly sealed switch gear. Sorry. So transient earth voltage, uh, this is a voltage that appears on the outside of the switch gear. And, and not to go into great depth about this because I have in the past, uh, but basically partial discharge is a current flow. It's a flow on the surface or through the center of insulation. And in metal type switch gear and bus compartments and things like that, it flows to the inner wall of the gear. And you've got a metal box and the currents are such high frequency pulses that they won't go through metal, they won't go through steel, they won't go through even copper foil on a cable. Uh, so they have to travel via surface, uh, the surface of the metal, what's called skin effect, and they'll find some path. They're trying to find a path to ground. The current will find a path through the door opening, any bolt, joint, anything like that where you don't have a, a continuous metal surface. And they'll get to the outside surface of the gear and it'll go down the outside surface of the gear and eventually hit the ground. And the ground on a power system is designed for it to be the very low impedance of 60 hertz. But these very high frequencies, it's high impedance. So thinking back to engineering school, which was a very long time ago for some of us, we have a current across a uh, impedance that generates a voltage. So we can measure that voltage. And we do that with uh, voltage probes on the outside of the switch gear, then maintaining non-invasive. This picture here on the right shows a channel eaten through a cast resin CT. This is important to note because if you were to look at that CT before it was cut in half, there's nothing to see. There's nothing to inspect. You could call a service company in, they could clean everything, they could run every test, but unless they're running a test specifically for partial discharge or if you're monitoring specifically for partial discharge, you wouldn't see this until it blew up. So that's why TEV testing is so important. Now cables, and cables are one of our biggest problem areas. Certain areas of the, of the uh, country have uh, issues with terminations and low quality terminations and uh, defects that are put on at the time of manufacture. And so we wanna be able to look down the cable, see if there's anything wrong in the cable itself. We wanna look at the terminations. We wanna see all the stuff that is internal. And when you have internal discharge in a cable, what you have is you have a, a discharge uh, current pulse that goes from the conductor to the shield and then down the shield. And if it's a determination, it may not go down the shield, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna, the, that uh, pulse is gonna travel down the conductor and it's gonna radiate to the shield. So there's always gonna be some component of the partial discharge 
in the shield. A shield is grounded at one or both ends. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a transformer around that ground strap. So the, the ground strap will form one turn of the transformer, very sensitive radio frequency uh, core will go around the outside of the, the cable and we'll be able to measure that. And you see these pulses here. This is what it looks like. These are unipolar pulses. The first one is the, is the actual partial discharge. The second one is reflected. When the pulse travels down the cable, it hits the far end and goes back. And sometimes we can use that to actually locate where the discharge is in the cable. So what are some of the advantages of, of full-time monitoring? The, uh, you know, if we can look at all these sensors simultaneously, we don't want to do something where we would uh, uh, multiplex and look at this sensor, then look at this sensor, look at that sensor. If we can look at all of them at the same time, we can compare them and see where it's coming from. Uh, we can look at trends over time. The PD may vary with humidity, it may vary with load, it may vary with temperature. So you can look at all these different trends and see what's happening. Uh, you know, precedence is a technology that looks at numerous sensors all synchronized together and tells us which one sees a pulse first. And we're talking at the speed of light. So if we look here and we're using TEV probes in this example, I've got five cabinets and I've got discharge in cabinet number four. Due to the nature of TEV and the fact that TEV amplitude is related to the high frequency grounding of a particular cabinet, you can have varying TEV amplitudes that may not relate to how close they are to the discharge. So in this example, we're saying the amplitude in cabinet number two is higher than it is in four, even though the discharge is in four. But if I had TEV sensors on every one of these cabinets, and I looked at when it occurred, I would see it occur at the probe on cabinet number four first. Now, the issue is TEV, like, uh, most electrical signals travels near the speed of light. And so 10 inches is a nanosecond, which is 10 to the minus nine seconds. So you need very precise timing. And if you have a lot of sensors, they all have to be synchronized to within a few nanoseconds just to be able to tell that. So it's, it's not easy to do technically, but if you look at the physics, it's pretty obvious that cabinet four is gonna see it before cabinet two. So if you can do that, that's gonna help you localize things. And precedence does another thing for us. If we have uh, a signal from outside, remember we're looking for very low signals in the presence of very high voltages and high noise sources. We wanna make sure that we can eliminate any external source of noise. If we take an antenna and mount it outside the gear and we do precedence including that antenna and we have some external noise source, there's an air conditioner in the room or there's a, uh, a guy welding in the room uh, next door that's going to come from outside. If it hits the antenna first, and then it hits the front panel of the switch gear, and we have TEV probes on the front panel of the switch gear, and we have a perimeter antenna, well, we can tell it hit the antenna first and then the switch gear. If it was internal to the switch gear, it would hit the switch gear TEV uh, sensor first, and then the antenna. So we can actively rule out external sources of noise, and that is incredibly important. You'll find in a lot of substations, there's a lot of noise that would interfere with TEV measurements. But if you have precedence, uh, and if you have precedence from numerous sensors at once, that'll help you out a lot. So what is full-time monitoring? Full-time monitoring, we're gonna look at several data points. We're gonna look at TEV, we're gonna look at ultrasonic, we're gonna look at humidity, we're gonna look at uh, RFCT. We're gonna look at all of those at the same time. We're gonna look at them full-time and we're gonna look at trends, and we're gonna use a variety of data from those trends to determine whether we have partial discharge or not, and we're gonna find out whether, where we have partial discharge. Typical system, you've got uh, a hub, which is a, uh, the thing that's gonna collect the data, process the data, provide that data in a format that, that you can read. We're gonna have nodes, which are localized uh, devices that are going to collect the data from the sensors and process it and send it to the hub. And we've got a variety of sensors, as you, as you would expect. So the first piece is a hub. It's basically an industrial computer with a number of uh, specialized boards in it for communicating with the nodes. It's going to power up the nodes, right? They need power. You don't want to run power to every single node in your switch gear. You'll end up with a cabling mess. They're going to communicate with all the nodes. It's going to synchronize those, synchronize those nodes. Remember, we need to synchronize all these sensors 
to within a few nanoseconds. And, you know, that's not trivial, especially if you've got the, uh, a large number of nodes. So it's got to do that. And then it's going to do your basic computer stuff. It's going to store the data, you know, waveforms or, or trends or audio clips of that. It's got to communicate with the outside world, right? We're not going to want to be in our substation looking at this. We want to be, well, nowadays we want to be in our home. I, you know, I can look at a sensor in uh, Canada and I can look at it from my desk in New Jersey. So you want external communications. And I want this presented in a nice way. I want some alarms and I want some tools that are going to help me with analysis. So the, the hub is going to do all that for you. The nodes, so the nodes are designed to go on uh, switchgear. They're magnetic mount on the switchgear and they're going to perform the various functions that they're going to power up the sensors if the sensors need power. They're going to do the actual sensing. They're going to take these analog signals. They're going to filter them. They're going to synchronize them. They're going to detect any pulses, capture waveforms. Then they're going to send them to the hub. So the, the nodes are doing a lot of the processing. They have a, a variety of sensor connections. Our hubs, our nodes are designed to basically handle the compartments front and rear from one cubicle of switchgear. And so you need one node per cubicle, basically. Uh, some of the features, we like to make it magnetic mount. It's all connectorized, so you're not out in a substation running little tiny wires. Uh, you know, it's plug and play. You put that all together, uh, magnetically mounted on the front of the gear, you can be up and running in, in an hour or two. Uh, alarm indications, it's got some LEDs that are going to tell you if it's got a problem, if it's powered up, if it's seeing TV above the alarm thresholds and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can get a quick look at something as you walk by. You still have the hub that's going to give you all the information either locally or remotely, but it's sometimes it's nice to walk by a box and see a red light on. There's a, uh, two types of nodes we have. One is the switchgear node, and you can see what this has. So this has two TEV sensors. One is built in and it mounted part of the rear of the unit. One is a uh, external probe. So you could put this on the front of the switchgear and you could put the probe on the back of the switchgear. Uh, it supports two ultrasonic sensors. So we want ultrasonic sensing in two different compartments. So connect those up and run those where you need to. Uh, the cable CT, so this will support one RFCT, which you could put on the uh, combined ground. If you didn't want to know everything about every phase in the, sense, on the system, you could put one RCT on the combined ground of a, of a uh, cable and get that. We've also got a contact surface temperature. So the temperature of the door of the cabinet should not go up. If the, if the, if the door temperature is going up, you, you've got issues. Um, we can also plug in relative humidity and, and temperature sensing. So as I've said, with surface discharge, uh, temperatures, uh, humidity plays a big part. And so we want to be able to test that. Now, if you have a focus on cables, as a lot of people do, we have a different node that just does cables. And so what this does is it supports three RFCTs, and that's really good for looking at the, uh, the three phases on the cable. So it'll support that. It still has the built-in TEV sensor. It still supports the relative humidity sensor and the surface temperature, but you don't get the ultrasonic sensors. So this is for a system where you might be very cable-specific. Then we've got different sensors, and the sensors are going to be in those same categories I talked about. You've got TEV, you've got ultrasonic, you've got cable, temperature, humidity, and antennas to, to rule out the background noise. And I'll talk about each type of sensor. So ultrasonic sensing, right? We want, we're listening for, for audio waves to come out of the gear. And this picture on the right is a very typical uh, installation for an ultrasonic sensor. It's listening through that louver to hear what's going on inside the cabinet. Um, the uh, middle picture is a contact sensor. So if I have uh, a piece of switchgear where there are no louvers, there are no bolt holes, there are no vents, there's no gap around the door that I can get into, I might need to get into that using a contact sensor. So what that device is, it magnetically mounts to the door and that center circle that you can see is the actual sensor and that couples with the metal on the front of the door and is listening for vibrations in that door. And that will pick up something that's going on inside the switch gear, even though you may not have any other way in. That's a very sensitive sensor. Its downfall is that it's non-directional. 
the gooseneck mounted one where you point it is where it's listening. If you put a contact sensor in the door, it's going to pick up out, outside and inside the door equally. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge. But if you have no choice, you have no choice. So TEV sensors, this picture shows the TEV sensor mounted in the, uh, in the node itself. And you just put that on the front door. It will pick up this uh, voltage pulse through the plastic of the node through the paint on the surface of the door, uh, even if it's textured paint, as, as most panels are, we're forming a capacitive coupling with the door. And because these are such high frequencies, we don't need a very good capacitor to pick it up. And, and that really helps us. We need good circuitry to filter it out and capture it, but the actual coupling is not that hard. The, the picture uh, on the upper left, upper right and lower right is an external TEV sensor. So since the node supports two sensors, I can use uh, that to look at a second compartment with one node. And all that is is a duplication of that capacitive plate that touches the painted surface. The next sensor is the RCT, it's a radio frequency current transformer. Uh, we have indoor ones, outdoor ones. The indoor ones are a split core and they have a, a clamp to hold them shut. And so after you have an outage, you would go in and you install these and they mount on the ground straps as close to the ground bar as you can get them. So they're safe. They don't, they're not exposed to high voltage. We're not clamping them on the cable. We're not clamping them on around any insulation. So they don't need to be protected from high voltage. What's nice is when you have an outage or during installation or during commissioning, you can install these, bring them out to outside connectors and either do spot check tests with the handheld equipment at any time in your convenience, or later on upgrade to full-time monitoring without having to take an outage. So if you're doing an installation of switch gear and your new cables or you're in there uh, doing maintenance on cables, you might wanna consider putting in RCTs at that time just so that you can run tests and maybe at some point look at, at full-time monitoring. If you're looking at outdoor stuff, whether it's in a switch yard or a riser pole, uh, it gets a little trickier because we don't have a split core CT that, that survives outside. So we have these uh, uh, solid, uh, RFCT is where you need to disconnect the ground, run it through the bore of the RFCT, and, uh, and reconnect it. Those work great, but obviously you need to take an outage to install those as well. Then you've got a variety of antennas, right? We want to form this perimeter of antennas uh, for noise cancellation, and you can have outdoor antennas if you're dealing with, say, a metal clad building like this, indoor. We want to put them uh, a, a meter or two away from the switch gear so that they, we've got some uh, coverage of the perimeter. We can put four for a small set of switch gear. Maybe we put six or eight for a larger uh, row of uh, switchboards. And uh, basically, they're going to tie into the various nodes. And they're nothing more than it looks like a good old-fashioned car antenna. That's the frequency band we're looking at. All right. And then with temperature and humidity, this is real simple. This is uh, a sensor that uh, mounts to the to the node, it magnetically mounts the switch gear. Um, do you need one or two of these per system? You know, unless the humidity is very different at one end of your switch gear from the other, uh, you don't need to uh, have one on every node, but one or two is great. I've got a customer now that has a variety of compartments and some outdoor gear, and they're very concerned about their humidity control. So they're putting multiple humidity sensors in here, and they're watching humidity relative to PD, and it's working very well for them. So you can put in more you don't necessarily need more unless you've got a humidity problem that you're tracking. So we've put our, we've got our sensors and we've got our system. We know what our parts are. Now we need to put together a, uh, a monitoring system. Well, it all starts with a one line diagram. And we're gonna end up drawing ourselves a picture like this, which shows all the sensors and the switch gear kind of from a bird's eye view. If you think of American style switch gear or ANSI style switch gear, You've got something in the front, you've got something in the back. Very often the back is a cable compartment. The front may be a breaker on the bottom with metering equipment on top. You don't need anything in the metering compartment because you don't have high voltage. So unlike your normal way of thinking where you're dealing with a one-line diagram, here we want to talk about compartments. You know, ultrasonic energy in a compartment is going to be, you know, related to anything in that compartment. So we need one sensor to look at that compartment. TEV on the door is going to be a result of uh, 
internal discharge inside that compartment. So we need one sensor. So you need to start thinking, not one line diagrams, you need to start thinking in terms of compartments when you're applying this type of system. So what I've done is I've taken a one line diagram from one of our customers and kind of broken it down into a, a simpler version, right? I've got, uh, looks like about 18 breakers. I've got my tie breaker. I've got two mains coming in. Uh, you know, that's a good picture, but in, in, in reality, the breakers are all in a line and the cables are all in the back. So if you take this type of one line diagram, say, I wanna, I wanna monitor everything in there because this is really critical. This is feeding my refiner. This is feeding my process. Uh, you know, my, it's feeding my hospital, whatever it might be. Uh, so what you do is you take this and kind of lay it out in compartment form. Now I've got your typical compartment looking at the front, I've got a whole row of breakers. Maybe above them I have metering compartments, but I don't care. And in the back, I've got a whole row of cables going out. And so I've got 17 front compartments with breakers in them. I've got 16 in the rear, because typically the one behind the tie breaker is empty. And I got a bunch of cables coming in and out. And I want to monitor all this because it's super critical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a picture. And these are just the icons we use when we draw the pictures. And I just put this up here so you'll understand the next drawing. But, you know, again, we're looking at placing these and making sure we have a sensor on every point we want to monitor. So here is the system. We've got cable nodes all along the back. And each one of those cable nodes has three RCTs. So we're going to be able to look at each phase individually. Uh, the cable node also has a TEV sensor on it. So I can uh, monitor TEV. Let's say I have some internal discharge in the back. I'll pick that up. I've got switchgear nodes on the front of the uh, cabinets. And they are going to uh, provide me with uh, TEV through their inbuilt sensor and also two ultrasonic channels. So I can take the ultrasonic channels from the front, run them to the back. Now I've got every single uh, compartment covered with TEV, ultrasonic, and every cable covered. I've also got one environmental sensor. I've only put one humidity sensor in this because it's a relatively small thing. I could throw a couple others in there. And then you can see my antenna connection. So the antennas connect to the TEV ports of the node. I've got four antennas, uh, nice well spread out perimeter. And all these nodes are daisy chained together. So we have a bus system that provides power, synchronization, data, everything in, in, one, in one bus. And we've got it connected to our hub. And then the hub is connected to some outside connection, to, to an internet connection. So we can get to this from anywhere. This system right here will cover these 17 cubicles very nicely, 100% covered, over 150 sensors in this one system. So imagine if you've got a small type monitor that handles 16 sensors or 16 channels, or some of them only have four channels, you couldn't do something like this. But we're going to look at 150 sensors all at the same time, 24-7. Get a lot of data out of this. If anything's going on, we're certainly not going to miss it. So when we're putting in our hub, how do we put this all together? We want to make sure that uh, you know the hub mounts to the wall or you put it on the shelf. You can, can it, when you're going to be first configuring it, you're going to need a monitor and a keyboard, so you want to allow for that. We need a, an internet connection, right? You see there's no user interface on this. There's nowhere to walk up and push a button. So I need to connect to, uh, to the internet somehow. It's been my experience, and I hope there's nobody from an IT department listening in on this. IT departments can be very painful to deal with when you say, oh, I've got this device from this company and I want to connect it to our network and from our network out to the internet. They're going to laugh at you and tell you to go away. Uh, that's what they do. You know, they're all worried about security. I understand that's their role. What we typically do in 95% of the cases is we tell the customer to provide a cellular modem. They're, they're cheap. You can buy them for a few hundred dollars. You can install it. Data charges are, are minimal connected to the internet, and then you can connect it, connect to it from anywhere. You don't need to involve the IT department. You can have this good, solid, full-time connection uh, and, and, and be done with it. Uh, the hub needs to be relatively close to the switch gear, but not right on top of it. It needs to be within 20 meters. So we got a fair amount of uh, room to mount that uh, where we can uh, conveniently get to it and get a monitor and a hub on it. So now I've got our monitor and, and keyboard on. So now I've got my hub mounted. Then I need to put the nodes on the switch gear. And we can do it two ways. We can magnetically mount it 
and run the cables outside, or we can do a more permanent installation where we run the cables inside the switch gear where we have uh, you know, more time, typically a new installation. They'll, they'll cut holes in the panels and they'll, they'll run these cables. All very nice and neat. The hub stay, or the node stays on the outside of the panel so you can see the LED indications and you can replace it if it were to ever fail without taking an outage. Sensors are much more robust. The odds that they fail are pretty minimal. Uh, but if your nodes ever fail, the last thing you want to do is have to take an outage in order to replace it. So it's good to mount those outside the gear. Uh, and this is, you know, you need to place it somewhere on the panel of the compartment that you are looking to, uh, to monitor with the TEV sensor. Then you need to put your sensors on. So an ultrasonic sensor, you're going to mount uh, typically outside, occasionally inside. This, this one where the gooseneck's been removed, uh, that was an inside the cabinet installation. But uh, if you want to do something non-invasive, you have it outside the gear. This middle picture on the bottom, the customer just had a, a quarter inch hole. And so he just put the sensor aimed at that hole. He had no louvers, he had no other vents, but that hole provided a nice path in. And I've seen that on a variety of gear where they actually have a little, little swing window to cover it. TEV sensor, so a TEV sensor, just like the node needs to go on the outside panel of the compartment you're trying to monitor. And we show a couple pictures of, of there. Their magnetic mount as well. You can tie wrap them on, you can take the magnets out and screw them down for a permanent installation, but most people just magnetically mount them. One thing to, to go back to this, one thing you can do, if you have some noise generating equipment in the substation, so I uh, did a substation where a customer had uh, a uh, dehumidifier, and a dehumidifier was spinning out a ton of electric noise, because it was a, a, uh, you know, not designed to control electronic noise that it emitted. And by placing a TEV sensor directly on that piece of gear, then when we did our precedence and we looked at it, we just ignore any signal that hit that sensor first. And so we're able to totally rule out any noise emanating from that, even though it may hit every other sensor in the system. So RCTs, the three main words on RCTs are safety, safety, safety. We are putting these inside the high voltage compartment. We are putting them on something that's connected to a high voltage cable. We want to make sure that under all conditions, this is 100% safe. So we need to make sure that our ground strap is adequate. You would be surprised at the number of ground straps I've seen from customers that cannot handle fault current. So you may have to make sure that your ground strap can handle the worst case fault current because you don't want your ground strap failing with your RCT attached to it. You also want to make sure that the, K, the RCT is not inside the electric field. If you get it too close to the termination, it'll actually cause PD. Um, and you get it in a really bad spot and you have a fault, you end up with a real problem. So we want to make sure that we've got a good ground strap, we've got good placement. Fortunately, ground straps go to ground. So we keep our RCTs near ground and we're pretty safe. We can bring those RCTs directly into the monitor hub or we can bring them to connectors. And that is something you might do if you're not doing monitoring up, up front. Maybe I'm gonna just test it every, uh, every year for a few years and then when I get more money in my budget, I'm gonna add the monitoring. So you can put a test box with some connectors in it or connectors mounted in the heat and the metering compartment. We see that a lot. The important thing is to get the RCTs in there and then you're set for life. And uh, you know, if you're not gonna do monitoring right away, you need somewhere to terminate those cables. So you can use one of those options. So then we need to place our antennas. So we definitely want to make sure we place our antenna in between the switch gear and any real source of noise. You know, if we know we've got something. Uh, I was at a customer site in Canada and they had a welding shop that was about 50 feet away. Well, they made sure they put a cat, uh, an antenna uh, far from that, uh, you know, between the switch gear and the welding shop. Other than that, you're going to just kind of form a perimeter and you want them far enough away so that you've got a decent perimeter. Uh, and the magnetic mount, you can mount them on the ceiling or you can mount them on, on the structure. You know, most indoor substations have a variety of places to mount them. If you're in an outdoor uh, situation, it's a little trickier. So we've mounted our antennas, we've mounted our switch gear, we've mounted our, our, our nodes, we've mounted our, our other sensors, we've got our hub mounted. It's gonna look something like this. And these are temporary installations. Well, not temporary, but they're, they're installations that are designed to be put on Without an outage, uh, they're put on very quickly. It takes you half a day to install one of these and get it up and running uh, without any outage. 
if you want to do a, a more sophisticated installation, you might do a, a, a permanent install here where the nodes are, are routed back through the doors, all the cables are routed inside, they've got trunking inside, and the sensors, some of the sensors are mounted inside, or all the sensors are mounted inside. Gives you a nice clean installation. Obviously, that's a lot more work, uh, and, and you need a long outage to do it. In this particular case, in these pictures, it was all brand new switch gear they were installing, so they wanted it monitored from day one, so it was no problem with the outage. This is a, a typical configuration. So the system goes out. Once you've connected everything, it goes out and it finds where these sensors are. It figures out where the cables are. Uh, you, you need to place these in, in your in your user interface. You need to arrange these so they make sense to you. And you know, you're not looking at just a list of sensors. You want a physical representation of what's going on. And that makes it easier to see when I've got two sensors that maybe are going in and out of alarm. Well, if those two sensors are side by side, that makes a lot more sense than if they're in just a list. And then who knows where they are in the gear. So a physical representation of the system is good. Now, if we're also going to look at uh, precedence, and so if I want to look at the time that each sensor senses a pulse, well, the sensors don't actually pick up the pulse. The node is the one that's timing the pulse and synchronizing the pulse times. And so if I have a antenna cable, say that's that's 10 meters long, it takes time to travel down that 10 meter cable. We need to actually worry about the lengths of the cables. So what we're going to do when we put in a system, we're going to ask you to enter the lengths of the cable so we can compensate that. We even need to compensate for a two meter long cable because at the speed of light, two meters is enough to throw us off from one cabinet to another. Now, this is the, the part that, that everybody is amazed by. I have to analyze the data. We're collecting all this data. We've got this massive amount of data. Well, I've got this hub. It's just going to, I'm going to get a red light when it's, when it's PD. And if I don't get a red light, I'm going to have a green light telling me everything's good. And that's all I need. If someone is trying to sell you a monitoring system that gives you a red light, green light, or a service that gives you a red light, green light without additional analysis, you want to keep, keep walking along because that is not how PD monitoring is done. At the state of the art today, you still need a little bit of expertise and a little bit of skill to look at the data and analyze it and determine what's PD and what's noise. There's lots of algorithms, lots of data that's going to help you. Our algorithms every day are better than they were yesterday in terms of automatically detecting it. But state of the art right now is that you still need to do some analysis. Now, what we do for a lot of customers is we sell it as a service. You don't pay for the equipment. We do the analysis. You don't need to have a PD expert, and that's great but you can do the analysis yourself. Um, so we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna talk about how you do that analysis. So you need some information, right? If I'm gonna analyze something, I need information. Well, what do I need? What do I get from the system? Well, one thing I'm gonna look at is trends. What's happening over time? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Is it different? If I have 10 cabinets that are identical, is one louder than the other nine? Well, that tells me something. I'm gonna look at waveforms, you know? There's a lot of things that generate noise. There aren't a lot of things that generate noise that looks like PD. PD is very fast. It's got a, a couple uh, uh, microsecond rise time and maybe a five microsecond decay time. That's very different than, say, a leaking arrestor or an air conditioning system. I'm going to look at that. I'm going to listen to sound clips. Very commonly done is you take the ultrasonic energy, which is a sound wave, but I can't hear it, and I use a technique called heterodyning, and that lowers it down into the range of human hearing. So if it, once it's brought down to the range of human hearing without altering the content of the sound, I can listen for patterns. I can listen to something. And then with a calibrated ear, you know, if I do this every day, if I'm an analysis guy and I do this, on, I can hear stuff. Or I can run algorithms on those sound clips, which might tell me things like harmonic content or uh, repetition rate or phase angle changes, things like that. So different algorithms can be run on the sound clips. The most important thing is a phase resolve plot. So a phase resolve plot is... Uh, a view of where the PD is occurring relative to the power system frequency. So if I look at one, you know, this picture here, is, assume it's one cycle wide, and I'm looking, each dot is, is an event, each, each green dot is one event, and it gives me an amplitude and a phase angle. The blue and red dots are increasingly numbers of events that occurred at the exact same phase angle and amplitude. So it's kind of a heat map thing. 
now I can see that, A, this is synchronous with the power system because it's not moving left or right. And it's concentrated in two groupings half a cycle apart. So with a phase resolve plot, I can see that it's synchronous. It, so if it's synchronous by the power, from the power system, then it's probably generated by the power system. If it's got two groupings of energy, it's probably occurring on the voltage peaks. And so I can, you know, I can tell a lot of information from a phase resolve plot. So in doing this analysis, and, and this is something you're all going to have to do if you get into monitoring or, or pay someone to do, you know, we're going to do trending is really important. We've got all these sensors. I can trend them over time. I can trend them compared to one another. So here's a picture from a real customer. Um, these are ultrasonic sensors, and there's seven of them in this system. And we'll look at them. There, there's seven pieces of switch gear. They're all pretty similar. Well, one of them's clearly seeing something different. And this is a logarithmic scale. So this peak here toward the right is 15 times higher than the, the stuff below. So if I've got one cabinet that's 15 times louder than the others, something's going on. You know, it doesn't take rocket science scientists to, to solve that. Here's something, I just downloaded this today. This is an active customer, I won't tell you who. And this is, the they've got uh, seven ultrasonic sensors in their system. And six of the seven are down at minus six dB, uh, occasionally going up to minus, that's as low as our monitor can measure. So that's basically dead quiet. And one sensor is just working its way up and just keeps getting higher and higher. On the right there, it's going up and down with humidity, which is a very important thing to keep in track. And it's up to 20 dB. 20 dB is 10 times worse than 10 dB. So again, we're 10, 15 times worse than all the other sensors in the system. And we're 15 times worse than we were three weeks ago. That's a system that's, that's, that's going on us. Someone needs to take action. Here's another system. Ultrasonic, a lot of sensors. I think there were 13 in this system. And you can see this green line toward the top is increasing. Now, this was a matter of months, but it went from 5 to 25 in, you know, three months. Um, oh, yeah, three months. The second line that's creeping up is a second sensor in the same cabinet. So they had louvers on the top and bottom, and they had a sensor in the top and the bottom. The discharge was up at the top. You saw that going up, and even the one on the bottom saw it a lot. And all the other cabinets were pretty quiet. So we're using time, we're using comparison to other sensors, and we're able to uh, trend it pretty well. We can trend it compared to humidity. Surface discharge is very humidity related. This is from another system that we had, where you can see the relative humidity is going up and down, and the ultrasonic level is going up and down with it. There are very few things that are going to cause a change in ultrasonic activity commensurate with uh, humidity, except partial discharge. So this is a clear indication that they had something going on. Here's an RFCT. So this was on a cable. And you can just see where this ramped up from 100 picocoulombs to 300 picocoulombs in a matter of a few weeks. Obviously, something's going on there. So trending's a big key. So the phase resolve plots I was talking about, where I have these two groupings that are occurring at the peaks of the voltage or just before the peaks of the voltage, and I see these two groupings half a cycle apart. That's really key. Now, I'm not going to align it and say, okay, this is occurring at the voltage waveform of 87 degrees, which is right before the peak of the, the 90 degrees. Remember, I've got three phases in that cabinet. So I've got things 120 degrees apart. I'm not going to try and align this with the phase of the voltage because I don't know which voltage is causing. So I'm just going to be concerned that this is a cycle wide. I got two groupings half a cycle apart. That's my important thing. And I've got quite a bit of difference between the peaks and the noise floor in between. That's going to tell me a lot. Here's a real world example. They had a cracked uh, CT here. And you can see the ultrasonic energy trended up very quickly. The phase resolve plot showed two groupings half a cycle apart. Customer took it out of service, pulled it out, saw the crack. That's where an example of phase resolve plots are really useful. Here's another one. A uh, customer had cables, they had them too close together. You can see the shield ends right where that, the top of that number two is. You can't have two different phases that close together after the shield. Very high level of uh, surface discharge. You see the two peaks on the phase resolve plot, half cycle apart, very consistent. Um, that's pretty obvious. So TEV, also gives us phase resolve plots. We're looking at these phase resolve plots here 
uh, half a cycle apart, a lot of activity. TEV tends to take this, this classic kind of shape uh, and, and that's gonna tell us we've got some internal discharge going on. Contact or floating metal is, is where you might have something floating or a poor contact inside a very high voltage field. And it gives this very characteristic shape where it's very flat, but it's got a wide phase angle. And that is because due to the physics of this type of discharge, the phase angle keeps changing as, as the PD progresses. So this is a very classic example. You could look at this and then you know that you've got something floating in that cabin. You need to address that. It may not lead to failure, but it's gonna prevent you from seeing much else. Cable, cable discharge, phase resolved plots, very characteristic. You're gonna see something different with cable uh, from the others. Remember with ultrasonic or with TEV, I'm not measuring a voltage, a positive, a negative, a polarity, but I am with cable. The electron's going one way through the hole or the other way through the hole, so I can give you a positive and negative, which is very characteristic of PD. So this is a really classic PD. I got 3,000 picocoulomb peaks here. I've got an issue somewhere in that cable. That cable deserves to, to get some additional attention. If I'm looking at a phase resolved plot that looks like this, well, there's not much going on there. There's a lot of activity. There's high level, 30, 40 dB. That's screamingly high, but it's not related to the power system. It's not synchronous. There's no groupings of energy. So I can tell that I've got this and I probably want to get rid of it so I can see PD, but I can tell you that that capture right there has nothing to do with PD. I talk about algorithms. There's algorithms that help us determine what's PD and what's not. Here shows an algorithm that has told us it's noise and it's 97% certain that it's noise. So you've got that and you've got the uh, the phases out plot, and you can listen to the SAM clip yourself. So you got three different modalities for finding a way, uh, finding what's PD and what's not. So with the sound clips, once we bring them down to the naked ear, we can we uh, bring them down to the uh, human range, we can listen and hear what's going on. If we've got two groupings, you know, two pulses per cycle at, at, the, at the voltage peaks, I'm gonna hear a lot of 120 hertz. If I hear only 60 hertz, or I look at it and I see on a phase resolved plot only one grouping and I see 60 hertz, that's gonna tell me that I've got probably corona. Corona tends to be much more one polarity than the other based on uh, the physics of polarity. High pitched tones or something that doesn't sound like your classic partial discharge, very easy to tell if you're listening to sound clips. So if, you're, if your monitor produces sound clips and you can get them remotely, that avoids sending a guy on site. And of course, waveforms, right? You wanna look at waveforms and they're gonna give you some indication whether you've got uh, a waveform that looks like uh, PD or not. And being able to capture waveforms at the time you have a high level event lets you look back in time. So oh, last night at 10 o'clock when I went into alarm, I grabbed some waveforms and sure enough, it looks like PD. So that's really helpful. So finishing up the, uh, the benefits of full-time monitoring, Right? We want to prevent catastrophic failure. We, we want to know these problems. We may not address them immediately, but we want to know about them before they lead to failure. We can make it informed timing on, you know, do I need to do maintenance right now? Do I have a turnaround coming up on my refinery and I need to plan extra time at this cabinet? If I know I've got bad terminations on a cable in the cabinet, during my turnaround planning, I can allot extra time. I can make sure I've got termination kits. I can make sure I've got qualified joiner. You can you can make informed decisions as opposed to waiting for it to blow up and then uh, reacting. So you don't want to be reactionary. Um, you know, periodic surveys are great. I would love part periodic surveys, but sometimes monitoring is justified because it gives you more information and can tell you more about your critical assets. Maybe your less critical assets where you might have some redundancy. Uh, you do periodic surveys, but on your critical, your main sub and things like that, or your main processes, you do full-time monitoring. Offline testing is great. It ha certainly has its place, but if you've got 50 cables in your system and it takes half a day to do uh, one offline test, that's 25 days of downtime just to test your cables. Wouldn't it be better to, to monitor all 50 of your cables and then when you see one start to go, take that one offline and test that, fix that. Also, you're testing real world. I'm running 60 hertz. I'm not running 0.1 hertz. I'm running at full load. Sometimes load is going to cause expansion of the copper and it's going to cause expansion of the insulation, which if there's a crack in the insulation in the real world condition, 
you're going to see it. Doing a VLF test, you will never see that crack generating PD. So it is, online monitoring is more real world. There are some limits, right? Now, <laughs> there's just no free lunch. Um, it's not perfect, and, and I'll be the first to say that. It's a lot better than anything out there, but it's not perfect. So you don't get absolute values of, of discharge. All the time we get asked, well, I've got a, an ultrasonic level of 40 dB. What's that in picocoulombs? Because I know my, my uh, standard calls for six picocoulombs as my maximum. There, there's no translation. Uh, and that's why the new NIDA standard for switchgear maintenance has online PD and it has the relative levels in uh, dB and has ultrasonic and TEV and those sort of tests in there, as opposed to the full Pico Coulomb offline tests that are designed for either offline or in a lab. It is much more real world uh, standard. Uh, you're gonna keep trending arc flash gear. It's tough to get TEV out of arc flash gear. Oil filled transformers can be a, a, an issue as well because they don't generate a lot of ultrasonic energy. Uh, and they also have a lot of discharge from phase to phase, which doesn't generate TEV. Um, RCTs, obviously you can't install those live. Everything else you can install live. So it's not a perfect system. I'm not here to tell you it's a perfect system, but I'm here to tell you it's the best system uh, available. And you follow that up with uh, periodic surveys on, on your uh, less critical gear. And lastly, you follow it up with offline tests of things that the monitor system determines there's a problem. So a monitor says, I've got a problem with this Switch gear, you schedule an outage and you do maintenance on it, uh, or in there, perhaps you do some offline testing. So that's that's my uh, my spiel on uh, full time monitoring, and now we'll uh, try and answer any questions that came up. Okay, we got one question right now. Uh, they're asking for some thresholds to, to, to determine the severity of PD. Your best source for those thresholds would be in the uh, NIDA MTS 2019 standard for switchgear maintenance. Uh, your other source would be from the manufacturer of the test equipment or the, uh, the monitoring equipment. You know, EA, we've been doing this for 40 years. We've got a lot of experience and we have built in thresholds into our test equipment or into our analysis that we say above this level, you should take this kind of action above that level, take that kind of action. There are very few international standards on this type of testing. They're, the only one is the need of 2019. Okay, just reading this one first. Uh, we currently use a competitor's handheld device to test for PD. As part of a regime of condition-based monitoring tests, do this every quarter. What is the typical typical cost of your system for a 10-panel board, and do you provide any monitoring support? And is it 100% guaranteed to pick up PD? <laughs> well, I'll answer the last part of that first. No, there is there is no guarantees in life. Uh, you know, uh, based on our experience, there are things that either occur. Uh, that might be shielded from the sensors, or they may uh, react too quickly. You know, it goes from inception to failure uh, faster than you can react. Um, in terms of costs, that's probably something we ought to take offline. We'll be glad to give you some costs. Um, the uh, uh, there was a middle part to that question, Tim. What was that? Uh, was typical cost. Do you, do, do you provide oh, any monitoring first. support? Yeah, so we, we uh, offer three ways of doing this. You can buy the monitor and then do your own analysis. Uh, at the opposite end of the scale, we provide it as a service where we provide the equipment free of charge and we do the analysis and we let you know when you have a problem. So you don't have a capital up front. You don't need experts on staff. And, uh, you know, we provide the equipment and we provide the analysis. And then the third way is a hybrid where you might want to buy the equipment because it works your budget that way. And then we provide the analysis for you. Uh, certainly if you buy the equipment and do the analysis yourself, we'll help you uh, with any determinations and, and be glad to look at things, but we're not going to do the analysis for you unless you contracted for it. Is there a standard for ultrasonic measurement values? That would be the, the NIDA MTS 2019.
And that's all the questions at the moment. Okay. Well, it, like I said, we'll send out the, uh, the presentation. We'll make the video available on our YouTube site. There's there's other videos on our YouTube site that go into more depth on the technologies and, and the, the science behind PD, if you want to learn more about that. And uh, other than that, uh, thanks for attending.